So today we're gonna to cover a few more software engineering concepts and principles that I think are gonna be super important if you're trying to develop AI applications, build AI agents, regardless of whether you're trying to do this with code or with no code solutions. I have a video I did not too long ago where I covered other concepts such as variables, large language models, tokens, prompting, and passing context. So if those are concepts you're still not too familiar with, I definitely recommend you check that out, but let's go ahead and get started. So when it comes to building any kind of AI application or workflow or agent, the first thing you want to get down clearly is going to be the workflow logic. Now obviously on DeFi, where you have this template, the workflow logic is right in front of us. But what I'm talking about isn't that you set it out here perfectly and very nicely in a very quick manner, but rather I'm talking about just literally getting a piece of paper or a notepad or whatever, and just writing out the steps of what you want your application or your agent to do. Now, if we look at this template right here, for this workflow, this is a sentiment analysis agent. Basically, we give this agent some text and it tells you what this sentiment is. Is it positive or is it negative? But as you can see in these steps, there's a couple of things that go into it before that job can be finished. First, we need to give it the text on this first block. After that, we're gonna check if it's a multi-sentiment text. That is, we just wanna verify if in the previous block, the user selected true or false for a condition. And depending on whether they select the true or false, we're then gonna go either to this block right here. After the text is processed with this prompt, we're gonna get the end result. And again, if they selected false, we're gonna go down to this block, process the text, and then get our result. Now for the person that built this the first time, these steps probably weren't too clear, but they probably started off with either a simple list or a simple drawing of what they wanted to do. And the more time they spent thinking about it, the more steps they were able to find that would end up leading to the end result of the process. Let's say for example, if you wanted to build a tool that checks your email and builds a draft reply. Well, the first step would be to be able to access your email. The next step would then be to actually read the email. After that, we would create a draft and then we would save the draft. But even something like that, that sounds simple at a high level, when you get down to all the moving parts, it becomes a little bit more complex. So with any application you build, any kind of service or any kind of AI agents, it's gonna be super helpful. You can just start out by writing it down in a list or some kind of template. And also super important, it's gonna be that even if you wanna build a very elaborate, very intricate app, you wanna start with the simplest workflow and then scale it up in complexity from there. So next thing we're gonna go over is APIs. Now, I'm sure you've been hearing this a lot, API this, API that, API key, API access. And if you've been trying to get a little bit into technology, I'm sure you're kind of like getting a headache from this. And maybe you're at the point where you're wondering, well, hey, you know, I thought AI was supposed to be super advanced, super useful, but I'm still having to deal with all these little headaches from having to deal with APIs. So API stands for Application Programming Interface. Now, I don't really think the definition of the acronym really helps too much understanding what it means, especially if you're not too much into the tech space. But all that an API does is provide a way for you to access another application within constrained permissions. So maybe you tried another agent framework, maybe like Crew AI or Agency Swarm or Cohere, and maybe you're just getting kind of sick of having to deal with all these API key setups, API authentications, and now you're here using a no-code tool such as Defy because you just don't want to deal with that. But if you go to this Tools tab right here, you're going to see all these wonderful tools which they've really gone out of their way to set up but as you click through them, you're going to see that you get this other field that says to authorize. When you set to authorize it, you have to give them your key. Same thing with a lot of the ChatGPT ones. There are some that are free, but I think for the most part, you are going to have to still provide an API key. So APIs, API keys, that's a headache that's not going anywhere. And the reason for this is because think of a gym membership, right? Whenever you signed up for that gym that you're paying month to month to go to, a part of the agreement is that because you're paying that monthly fee, you get access to the gym as a member. But even though you have access to the gym, there's still only somewhat limited things that you can and can't do within the gym. Just because you can go inside the gym doesn't mean you can go into the manager's office or the maintenance office or to the storage room in the back where they keep more equipment or, you know, maybe even some VIP areas. And the other thing that the gym membership allows is that because they have some of your personal information, to some extent, if you decide to do something like steal equipment or break equipment or, I don't know, harass other people, they pretty much have a way to trace it back to you. So that's the main reasons why, even though you're using no coding tools, and even though these tools are supposed to be easier to use, you still have to deal with the headache of APIs and API keys, because again, it's just a matter of security and limiting access as well. Another thing we're going to talk about is also data manipulation. I'm sure you start looking into things like scraping data, processing data, and parsing data and some of the common formats you're going to hear about is csv json and xml 
So depending on the use case that you have and the kind of things you're doing with that data, more and more you're gonna be hearing about these formats and how they're processed. Because at the end of the day, if you're downloading data and if you want that data to be used by another application or you want that data to be saved into a database, it has to be formatted in a manner that is commonly and frequently used by these applications. The easiest one I can think of explaining to you is CSV, which just stands for comma separated value. So if you ever open an Excel file on your computer and you wonder how the program is able to tell what all the different rows are, where all the different columns are within that spreadsheet, all it is is that if you're to get that file and open it without Excel, you would see that all those different little rows that you see and all the different columns are really just separated by commas. And that's the name, comma separated value. If you're to look at something like JSON data, well, same thing, this is structured data, but instead of being separated by commas, it's grouped by square brackets and those curved brackets. But again, if you're coming across issues where maybe you're getting output from tools like ChatGPT, and maybe you don't know how to save that output to a different program or how to make use of that data so that it can be saved somewhere in a database, a lot of it's gonna have to do with just formatting it and saving it properly in one of these formats. And the next thing that brings me to is the concept of debugging. Mm -hmm. So whenever you start building these applications, again, regardless of whether you're doing code or no code, you're gonna come across a lot of different problems. Sometimes it's not gonna work the way you want it to. Sometimes, or most of the time, you're gonna get a lot of errors and you're gonna find that with each new thing that you learn and each new obstacle that you go over, you're gonna be running into different issues. And that's where the concept of debugging comes in, which really just means that as you come across unwanted behavior from your programs and applications, you start going down the rabbit hole of problem solving so that you can find a solution, fix your code, fix your application, but it is gonna be a constant cycle of learning where you find one problem, you find a solution, that solution may fix the problem you have right there and then, but then this might give light to a different set of problems that you just hadn't looked into. I think debugging is one of the parts where a lot of people that become very excited by tech and all of its opportunities begin to start falling off from, mainly because it can be very frustrating and very time consuming. Debugging in itself is a skill that you're gonna be developing over time because the more projects you make, and the more things you learn, the better you're gonna get at pinpointing where the errors could possibly be. And the last thing I wanna talk about is user interfaces. So all user interfaces are, is really just the thing you look at when you're interacting with the application. Here with Defy, we're looking at this user interface, which has these very nice blocks. It has these very nice lines. We can click them, we get a menu. So it's really just how you're able to interact with the application. And the reason why I bring this up is because once you get your workflow logic done, once you connect it to all your tools and APIs, once you're able to process the data efficiently and you're done with all the debugging, you can have a very cool, very efficient process. But then comes the question of, well, I have this AI thing. How do I get it to my users? How do I make sure that they can use it? They can have access to it. They don't wanna log in and click through all this. They wanna be able to just go to a page or download an app and use it. Well, that's where user interfaces comes in. And there's a lot of different applications, a lot of different softwares that help you streamline making a user interface. But again, this is pretty much an entirely different concept in software engineering. Because if you're building out something like this in Defy, or maybe you're building a career agent, you're pretty much building what's called the backend, which is you're building all of the logic and all the infrastructure for how the application works. Now, when it comes to how users are gonna see the application and use the application, that's more so related to user interfaces. And while there's a lot of no-code tools that are coming out to build out user interfaces, you really wanna go with the option that's most compatible with the backend that you already built. Now, I know that was a very brief overview on user interfaces, but as someone that works as a backend developer, that's typically a part of the application building process that I really don't deal with, and I usually either outsource to someone else or collaborate with somebody else on. So those are pretty much the five topics or concepts I want to cover for today. If you do have any more questions or maybe you're still having a little bit of trouble understanding some of these concepts, I'm gonna leave a link in the description where you can book a one-on-one -on -one call with me completely free and I'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. AI is moving super fast and consequently, I think that's making technology move even faster. So I think it's more important now than ever to learn a lot of these foundational concepts so you can get a good grasp on these technology changes if you want to build these things for personal projects or if you're trying to find a way to make money with AI. Again, I'm not trying to make these videos technical lectures for you. You can always look up very deep, very detailed lectures on YouTube or take a college course or buy a course online. 
But if you're somebody that's trying to learn this as quickly as possible so that you can start making things, so that you can start trying things out on your own, I do try my best to give you a high level, simple overview so you can get started and moving forward with your projects. Let me know in the comments if you found this helpful or if you still have some questions regarding some of these concepts or maybe some other parts that you're stuck on when using these no code tools or even some of the coding frameworks. I really thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one.